Good morning once again, and welcome to this morning's uh, mentoring hour. It's uh, such a joy to take time to study God's word and uh, also to take time to interact with one another. Let's pray and we will get into this morning's topic. I want to request one of us, um, one of our students to please lead in prayer. And after that, we will begin um, you know, sharing on the topic that we have selected for this morning. Could one of you kindly unmute and pray, please? Praise the Lord. Yes, yes, Mr. Venkateshan, please go ahead. Please go ahead and Lord, read. we come into your throne of grace in the name of your only beloved Son, Lord Jesus Christ. Above Father, kindly remember us. Do bless uh, this program for this morning and encourage us to hear the word of God. God, we pray for all participants in this meeting. Kindly bless all people, those are participating in this meeting, and utilize those speakers that are delivering messages in this conference. Oh God, I have compassion on all people, and help us to study their word and to minister this generation. In the name of Lord Jesus, we pray, God. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Mr. Venkateshan. Um, and let's go ahead uh, and, and talk about the topic that we have chosen for this morning. We are going to talk about women in ministry. Uh, it's a, a topic that is you know, discussed around the world, and there are various perspectives. For this morning, we will focus in on the biblical perspective um, about women in ministry. So that's what we're going to look at. We'll take some time to see what the Bible says, after which we will open up a time for questions. So those of us who have questions can uh, either unmute and ask, or you can please post it here in the chat, and we will do our best to answer those questions. Okay, women in ministry, um, what does the Bible have to say about women in ministry? We know that uh, the Word of God has many women, uh, many of whom uh, prophesy, uh, many, many of whom have prophesied, women who have led, who've brought deliverance, who've spoken wisdom in difficult situations. Um, we have a couple of names uh, for us this morning. Deborah, all of us recognize her as a judge and a prophetess who led her people to victory, protected her people uh, from the enemy. Uh, Esther is another classic example of someone who led her nation to deliverance. Um, she People looked up to her, and you know she was able to lead her people in a difficult time. In the New Testament, we have names such as Anna, Anna, uh, who saw uh, the the Lord Jesus as a baby, uh, and you know she was a prophetess, and that's the description regarding Anna. Uh, Philip's daughters prophesied in Acts 21. We have a record of uh, four of his daughters who um, flowed in the gifts of the Spirit and who prophesied. Now, let's begin uh, from the book of Genesis. When we talk about men and women, the Bible teaches us that both men and women are image bearers of God. God created both man and woman in his own image. Um, so there, that's quite clear in Genesis 1 verse 27. So while man is created in God's image, so is a woman. Uh, and Galatians chapter 3 verse 28, uh, that tells us in under the new covenant, there is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. So both male and female, man and woman, are one in Christ Jesus. When we consider the grace that God gives us, his enabling uh, in our lives, uh, scriptures tell us that God has given both men and women 
grace alike. In 1 Peter 3, verse 7, talking to husbands, uh, Peter says, Husbands, likewise dwell with them with understanding, giving honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life. So men and women are heirs together of the grace of life, um, that your prayers may not be hindered. God has given grace alike to both men and women. When we talk about the gifts of Christ, Ephesians chapter 4, um, verses 8 and 11, they talk about the Lord Jesus giving uh, gifts to the church, the fivefold ministry offices. And uh, their scripture tells us that he gave gifts unto men, gifts unto men. When we consider the Greek word there, uh, it men here is uh, in plural um, whereas the root word is anthropos which is actually a gender neutral word so though paul wrote he gave gifts unto men in english it's men or other languages it it may seem like it is of the male gender however the term used there is a gender neutral word called as anthropos. So he was saying that Christ gave gifts to the church. The fivefold ministry offices are both for men as well as women. That same term anthropos is used uh, in Matthew 4, 4, where we, we read the scripture, man shall not live by bread alone. Man or woman, all of us depend on God's word. Um, and so it's the same way that we would interpret Ephesians chapter 4. The same term anthropos is also used in Paul's instruction to Timothy. When Timothy is instructed to, um, uh, you know, Okay, just a moment. I'll. I hope uh, you're all able to see my slides. If there's a problem, please let me know. Okay, wonderful. Sure, I'll just get back. Sorry for that interruption. So we were saying that the gifts of Christ are for uh, both men and women. Uh, and Paul also talks about committing to faithful men in the work of um, uh, the work of God. So he's talking about uh, selecting both men and women to continue the ministry. So we've seen so far that God's grace is given equally to both men and women. Gifts are given equally. Gifts of Christ are given equally to both men and women. Uh, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, as we go back to Acts chapter 2, verses 17 and 18, you know, scriptures tell us that um, the promise uh, in Joel was fulfilled, that God poured out his spirit on all flesh. Uh, and, and the promise uh, still stands. The promise says that God, uh, on men, men servants and maid servants, he will pour out his spirit. So uh, God is willing to pour out his spirit on both male and female. Similarly, when it comes to the operation in the gifts of the Holy Spirit, the Bible does not um, discriminate or, or say that um, uh, only men or only women can operate in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Both men and women can operate equally in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. When we talk about ministry offices, we've uh, considered you know, considered uh, earlier from Ephesians chapter 4 um, th that the fivefold ministry offices are for both genders. Uh, here again, in another important passage, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 28, we see the same thing that uh, God appoints. God appoints um, people in ministry offices. Uh, here again, there is no, uh, there, there is no a particular instruction that this is meant only for um, men or for women. So we we come to the topic of leadership, leadership and um, leadership again. Uh, we see that it's one of the grace gifts, uh, and uh, we 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 notice that you know if God uh, calls, God can call both men and women. Uh, 
um, as leaders and if the women carry uh, that ability then uh, a woman can also be a leader so let's quickly look at a couple of other things and um, in in a short time we're going to open uh, it up for questions so in the new testament based on whatever we've seen there is uh, um, there are women who were ministers of god uh, we have uh, phoebe uh, who uh, was an overseer of of uh, a church a junior who is called as a notable apostle priscilla uh, a teacher of God's word, uh, even in history, we uh, there are many women that that we can look at and see how God worked mightily through them in various nations, um, and. Um, uh, now we'll we'll quickly come to some of the uh, passages which are challenging for us to understand and interpret and on the basis of these scriptures, um, we could say that there is a lot of um, uh, you know like. Uh, there are arguments and uh, different points of view uh, around the world. So first uh, passage here in 1 Corinthians 11, 3, where um, uh, the scripture says that, uh, but I want you to know that the head of every man is Christ, the head of woman is man, and the head of Christ is God. So here it it, it seems like you know there is a prescription for uh, a woman to have man always as the head over her but we must understand that this is in the context of family this is in god's government of family in the context of family god says that man is the head over a uh, woman and also another thought here is that uh, as he mentions that a head of christ is god we we also know that uh, Christ and the Father are co-equal, and yet uh, there is submission in the Trinity. So it does not talk about inequality when um, uh, women are being asked to submit to their husbands. Uh, let's now come to some of the other difficult passages. Um, the first one here is, it says, let your women keep silent. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 14 verses 34 to 35. Um, here we, it seems as if Paul is telling women to keep silent in the church, but we must understand that this passage was given um, as an instruction. Okay, um, I think the slides are not slides visible. Are not I hope... The slides no are not moving, ma'am. All right, no problem. We'll uh, you can have a look at it now. I think it's better now. Wonderful. Uh, so you probably missed some of my slides, but uh, that's all right. So we're talking about this difficult passage from First Corinthians chapter fourteen. This passage was given by Paul um, uh, to instruct the church to operate in the gifts of the Spirit in an orderly manner, and so there are three uh, separate things for which Paul says keep silent first is he says keep silent uh, if uh, there is no interpreter for a message in tongues uh, secondly he says uh, keep silent once one has spoken their prophecy uh, to then keep silent and thirdly he tells women also to keep silent so our understanding here is that in the context of the corinthian church it's most likely that women were were asking their husbands questions uh, you know during uh, their gatherings which is why paul had to uh, instruct so that things go on in an orderly way so there are three separate things for which paul said keep silent so on the basis of this you know we never say that one must not speak in tongues or um, that one must not prophesy and for us to uh, say that women must not speak or they must not teach uh, would again uh, not go in line with what Paul was saying. So this is a difficult passage. Uh, and uh, unless interpreted in its context, it may seem like Paul is saying that women should not speak in church. Uh, the next difficult passage, of course, is from 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 11 through 15. Here again, Paul says, uh, I uh, let a woman learn in silence with all submission, and I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over a man, but to be in silence. So again, you know, when we understand uh, this in its context, you know, we recognize that um, in the church setting, in the uh, church 
gathering you know he he um, was instructing to maintain order and secondly uh, that uh, uh, in in the context of the Ephesian church, uh, it was likely that many people who were getting saved and coming into the church were bringing in, um, you know, their their cultic mindset, where um, in in their pagan practices uh, they they used to usurp the authority of men, which Paul did not want happening in the church. Which is why, you know, he he places an instruction here. And he says, uh, women learn in silence with all submission. And I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over a man. Uh, however, if we look at the ministry of Apostle Paul himself, we see that there were women in his team. We uh, shared some of the names earlier. Uh, we saw women such as um, uh, Phoebe, Junior. Priscilla, Lydia, you know, so many uh, women who were part of his team and who were serving. So quite obviously, uh, he didn't mean that, you know, women cannot be in leadership or that women cannot teach. So uh, just want to conclude uh, right now and say that uh, we must recognize that God has always used and continues to use both men and women in different ways for the purposes of his kingdom. Um, and so the question is not who's greater, but uh, to to. Um, embrace uh, God's design and God's instruction in scripture and keep moving forward to do uh, kingdom work. So uh, I'm going to stop with this. And at this point, um, uh, we can open up for questions. Uh, my apologies that you couldn't see the slide transitions quite uh, clearly. Um, however, yeah, if there are any particular questions, we can look at it now. Please feel free to unmute and ask. Uh, I just have a common question, ma'am. Thing is that uh, uh, as a uh, uh, Christian woman, uh, is that she permitted to wear bangles or bindi? Yeah, we've been searching for it. We have a lot of questions. People used to question me on that aspect. So I was still in a uh, dynamo. So if I able to get some answers, I think it will be well and good. All right. Uh, thank you, Sriraj, for that question. Uh, there is an instruction in First Peter chapter three, um, where you know women are uh, instructed to uh, wear modest apparel. Modest apparel. Um, so you know anything that qualifies as modest apparel uh, is is uh, fine. Uh, and uh, I would say. Uh, since you're asking about, you know, bangles or bindi, we'll also have to look at the cultural um, aspect. This is my view, uh, but I, you know, other faculty could please come in. Uh, so if we are in a particular place as believers and um, uh, um, wearing, uh, you know, a, a certain kind of uh, um, or, or dressing up a certain way, uh, if if we are kind of blending with the unbelievers, then I would suggest that, you know, uh, we don't do it, but I, I don't um, see why you know women can't wear bangles because jewelry is in in the Bible. Uh, when it comes to, of course, uh, you know you said bindi. I think there's a religious uh, aspect connected to that, so I wouldn't um, you know I, I I would say that uh, for Christian women it wouldn't be appropriate. But yeah, I'll I'll leave it open to um, the faculty, and these are my views. Okay. Okay, thank you, Shri Raj. I, um, but uh, I haven't got because I have mentioned the scriptures actually to a uh, lot of people, mm -hmm. but still uh, they said no. Uh, we need the proper scriptures which can uh, quote it out. So mm -hmm. I've been searching for it I, and I've been analyzing also. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. if I get one, I'll be uh, helpful. That'll be helpful because a lot of uh, uh, women who are getting baptized, they come up with so much of questions. Uh, 
putting up why I shouldn't wear bangles sometimes in the south, uh, why I shouldn't uh, uh, have flowers on my uh, head. So, so much of questions are there. Okay. Um, um, I Yes, Pastor. Uh, just, um, uh, um, just, just good morning. Sir. Yeah, good morning, sir. So, um, so the issue is about you know wearing. Uh, let's talk about wearing jewelry in 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 general. Uh, so there are two passages in the New Testament. Uh, one is First Timothy chapter two, uh, where Paul tells you know, women to dress modestly, and the other one is in First Peter three, where Peter is talking about uh, women. Uh, let not be the outward uh, adorning of, uh, of the uh, hair and so on, right? And uh, uh, so people use that, First Peter 3, as uh, a reason why uh, women should not wear jewelry. But the person that Peter is pointing to is Sarah. You know, in First Peter 3, verses 1 to 12, the context, he says, look at Sarah, right? Uh, so then you ask the question, did Sarah wear jewelry or not? We're talking about Abraham's wife. Did, you know, he's pointing to Sarah. So you go back to the Old Testament and say, did Sarah wear jewelry or not? Right? Then you look at Abraham, and I've just said one verse in it, Genesis 24, 53. Abraham sends his son, um, his servant Eliezer to find a bride for Isaac. And in that, in chapter 24, and I've just given you one reference, what do they do? They bring jewelry. You know, the servant brought out jewelry. So what could it be? It could be earrings, necklace, I don't know what, all, but jewelry of gold, clothing, and he gave it to Rebecca. So I don't think he would have bought torn clothes, tattered clothes. You know, Genesis 24, 53 says, Abraham sent his servant Eliezer with lots of jewelry and clothing to find the bri uh, her bride for Isaac. And Genesis 24, 53. So if people want the scripture, you can use Genesis 24, 53 and say, hey, look, our father Abraham was married. He's the husband of Sarah. Sarah's referenced in First Peter 3 as pointed as an example. What did Abraham do? He sent jewelry, jewelry of gold, clothing, silver. He sent it. So the question is, do you think Sarah wore jewelry? Answer is absolutely. And we have scripture reference for it, right? So, uh, so, so the point in First Peter three is not to completely exclude jewelry, but rather use it in a way that you know where, where the priority is faith. The priority is a heart. Um, he says he talks about a um, you know a heart, a pure a heart that is the hidden man of the heart, which in the sight of God is of a you know. Of a quiet spirit. So he's talking about our focus being on the hidden person of the heart, not excluding jewelry, because Sarah, the person he referenced, is did wear jewelry, and we have the scriptural reference for it. So that's one side about using jewelry, fine clothing, all that. The other thing is what Nancy was referring to is cultural. You know, uh, different cultures have different clothing, uh, different. Uh, things that they do, so we can't give a universal answer. The only guideline is, uh, in the you know first case, of course, it should not be religious. The, so if somebody wears a bindi, the question, the thing is, why are you doing it? I mean, if you're doing it as an act of worship, if you're doing it as a religious expression that yeah, this is you know Shiva's third eye or whatever, then that is wrong. But if you're using it just as you know a part of your uh, makeup on beauty that's not wrong that's your choice right so the, the question should be what is why is that person doing that right uh, is it is it an act of worship to some false god or is it just a part of their attire and then we leave it at that because globally you look all around the world different cultures have different expressions of uh, you know attire food customs and so on so the underlying question is, is it an act of worship or is it just a cultural thing? So that differentiates whether we can do it or not do it. I hope that um, addresses it seriously. 
Thank you, Pastor. Uh, and uh, Sriraj, hope that uh, has addressed your question. Um, if it has, please let us know. You could uh, kindly type in the chat here. Um, I'll move ahead with the next question here. Prem Shastri asks, according to the Bible, OK, Sriraj uh, has a thumbs up for us. Uh, Prem Shastri asks, according to the Bible, should a woman work or stay at home? Uh, based on some of the names that uh, we, we you know, we mentioned this morning, uh, God calls men and women uh, with grace and gifting and uh, ability. So based on that ability, uh, women can do what God has called them to do. One name we mentioned this morning is Deborah, who was a judge. You know, she was a um, she instructed the uh, people in the military. You know, the chief military commander. So obviously, you know, she was not at home. Uh, she would have taken care of her home responsibilities, but she also had uh, a, a role outside in the world. Uh, so. As far as the Bible is concerned, there's no such prescription that women are meant to only stay at home. Uh, Prem Shastri, I hope that has addressed your question, but um, uh, please feel free to let us know. And other faculty as well, if you would like to add to this. Can I add something, Pastor? Yes, yes, yes Pastor Lina. So uh, if you look at uh, Acts 18, uh, verses 2 and 3, and uh, Acts 18, 26, it talks about Priscilla. Priscilla, along with her husband, Aquila, is uh, described as a tent maker and also a teacher of the gospel. So she worked alongside her husband in both uh, business and ministry. And uh, Lydia, who's mentioned in Acts chapter 16, verse 14, uh, is also a successful uh, businesswoman. Uh, she was a dealer in purple cloth. And she also played a significant role in uh, supporting the early church and if you look at um, you know a uh, proverbs chapter 31 verses 10 to 31 you know talks about a virtuous woman and there she's uh, depicted as someone who is hard working diligent who engages in various activities which is inclusive of buying and selling goods managing household taking care of the family and she's involved in both domestic and uh, you know tasks and also like business ventures like buying a field planting a vineyard and also making and selling uh, goods so here in proverbs chapter 31 a virtuous woman is portrayed as a wise strong someone who's capable and contributing to the household's um, well-being and also for the uh, prosperity uh, if you look at um, uh, first timothy chapter 5 verse 8 uh, you know the it emphasizes there for providing the family it says if uh, if anyone does not provide for his relatives and especially for the members of his household he's denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever so here it's speaking about responsibilities of both men and women uh, to ensure that the family needs are uh, met. So I think uh, these are a few examples, and I hope it uh, helps. Uh, yes, thank you. Thank you, Pastor Selina uh, Prem Shastri. Hope that has addressed your question. Um, please let us know in the chat. Uh, we'll move ahead with um, the next question here. Alias is asking, ma'am, God uses men more in his ministry or women? Um, my answer would be that you know God has given us the grace, and there is a calling. It depends on uh, how we we serve with it, you know, how we use what God has given. So, depending on who's um, uh, who's walking in it obediently, and you know, in faith and uh, working hard. God can work that much more through that person. Doesn't matter if that person is a man or a woman. So that would be my answer. Uh, but other faculty, please do share if you have any views on this. I like just to share, like yes, uh, you know, in the Bible we see that God is not a partial God. Uh, I think Romans chapter. Uh, 2 verse 11 says uh, uh, he's not a partial God and also like you mentioned Pastor Nancy in your uh, presentation that uh, you know Galatians chapter 2 was uh, sorry Galatians 3 28 says there's neither Jew nor Gentile neither slave nor free there's no uh, neither male nor female all are one in Christ Jesus so you know um, uh, yes this 
uh, context is, is uh, salvation and uh, spiritual value, but even then, you know, there is no gender uh, distinctions uh, in God's kingdom. And we also see in uh, in church history, uh, in the Old Testament, New Testament, even in church history, God has uh, used uh, many men and women. Um, of course, there are uh, men more than women mentioned in the Bible. Again, we have to look at it in the cultural context uh, because... Um, you know, in the cultural uh, context was more a patriarchal society than a matriarchal society. And so when men spoke, it was uh, listened to, it was taken as authority rather than uh, women speaking. So God, uh, you know, when he worked in history, he used uh, men more, but then it does not mean that, uh, you know, that women were not used by uh, God. So I'll just leave it at that. Thank you, Pastor Nancy. Sure. Thank you, Pastor Selena. Um, I hope that has addressed uh, your question, Alias. Uh, we move ahead with the next question here from Shakti. Can a woman work as a pastor? Because many people say that she cannot work as a pastor. Uh, so I want to go back to um, Ephesians chapter 4, where we've seen that uh, Christ has given gifts to the church and then goes on to talk about the fivefold ministry offices. Uh, he has given gifts to men. And we saw that word there, anthropos, which is gender neutral, which simply means that, uh, you know, either a woman or a man can be in uh, one of the fivefold ministry of offices or multiple offices. So the answer to your question would be, yes, a woman can be a pastor if God calls her to be one. Um, I, I hope that has addressed your question. Please let us know if you have any follow-up questions. OK, I am just taking that as you're OK with the answer. And then we will move ahead with Rin's question here. Then says, what if you are part of a church where people don't believe in women's ministry and God has called you to prophesy or pray for people? How should we approach? Okay. Uh, so, Rin, uh, are these two questions connected? The next one, uh, you're saying, what if you are a pastor's wife? Um, so, are you saying that um, a woman who wants to pray and do what God's calling her to do is limited because of the belief of, of that particular community, then what should one do? Okay, that's a tough one. <laughs> I think I will request Pastor Ashish. Uh, Pastor, if you could please uh, shed some light on it, your views. Sorry, uh, what was the question again, please? Uh, so Rin is asking, what if you are a part of a church where people don't believe in a women's ministry and God has called you to prophesy or pray for people, how should we approach? And connected to that, uh, what if you are a pastor's wife? Yeah. So one is to always, you know, operate out of respect. That means, um, you know, whichever, I mean, if the church doesn't approve, it, then don't do it there. Uh, not because you don't believe in it, but because you're respecting that environment, that setting. So obviously, if they don't permit that women to minister in that congregation, in that church, then don't do it there. Do it outside. So you know, if you are out on your own, uh, you're ministering outside, you're, most, you're, you're free to do that. Uh, but sometimes, some churches would even cover that. They would say, no, as long as you're a part of the church, you cannot minister anywhere. So then you have no option but to leave that church and go to a place where you will have the freedom to minister. Uh, so the, the, the basic thing is respect and freedom, right? So you respect whoever you're under, follow their rules. But if you don't have the freedom to do what you feel, what you believe God's called you to, then you need to move yourself to a place where uh, you can have the freedom to do it. Um, what if you are a pastor's wife? Well, if you're a pa it's, so whether you're a pastor's wife or not, it all depends on God's calling on on you as a person. Just because you're a pastor's wife doesn't make you a pastor automatically. Uh, just because you're a pastor's wife doesn't make you an anointed person automatically, right? It all depends on the call of God. So uh, being a pastor's wife doesn't mean 
you have the same calling as your spouse. No, that's not true. It, it all depends on what God has called you to do. And the answer would be that uh, the pastor's wife has to recognize whatever God's called them to do and pursue that call and uh, you know, uh, respond to what God's called her to do. I don't know if, if that was a question that if you're looking for something else in that question, but you can let us know. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you for sharing. And uh, Rin, yeah, Rin says yes. So uh, we have addressed her question. Uh, I see the comments of Sri Kumar, Sri Raj. Sri Raj, uh, I think this was your earlier comment. Um, Okay, Narendra Kumar says, uh, praise the Lord all, should women cover their heads in congregation? Okay, so um, we we know that, uh, you know, there's this passage, 1 Corinthians 11, if I'm not wrong, uh, where, uh, you know, Paul instructs and he tells uh, women to cover their, their heads. But as we look at the end of that passage, um, he, he makes it quite clear that there is no such custom in uh, the churches of God, meaning he was instructing the Corinthian church to do this, uh, you know, because they had they had um, uh, certain practices of uh, um, you know hairstyles and other things which were connected to their earlier worship and all those uh, things were coming into the church and to prevent um, you know confusion paul instructed that particular church and uh, so since the passage is quite clear that it was instructed only to the corinthian church uh, it's not mandated for women all over the world you know in all churches to uh, cover their heads in congregation so that's uh, what I would like to share. If there's anything more that our faculty would uh, like to add, please, please do. Yeah, I think uh, Pastor Nancy, you uh, you covered it. Just uh, First Corinthians chapter eleven. Yes. Uh, and uh, you know, it's uh, the the Corinthian culture cultural context was such that you know women typically had long hair, and a married woman would have her head uh, covered. Uh, you know, and also, uh, 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 you know, prostitute typically had a head uh, shaved. So uh, when they become uh, believers and they come into the church, so they had all kind of people from all kind of backgrounds who are saved. And now they're part of the local church. I think in that context, in that view, both in the cultural context and the backgrounds that they come from. So Paul is instructing uh, women, you know, that they have to cover their heads while praying or prophesying in the local church church and like you mentioned in verse 10 it says for this reason women ought to have a symbol of authority on her head because of the angels and verse 16 it says but if anyone seems to be contentious we have no such custom nor do the churches of God so this verse clearly indicates verse 16 that this practice of head covering was a custom specific to the uh, Corinthian church but when he's talking about the symbol of authority he's uh, basically Paul is uh, explaining you know the expression of submission to spiritual authority which is God's governmental structure the authority that he has placed in the church um, uh, God's governmental authority and structure in the place is that you know the pastor is the head of the church like the uh, the man is the head of the home so the women submits out of that uh, governmental uh, structure and the authority that God has placed so it's more like a spiritual authority but since it is a more cultural context it's not applicable to all other churches and like Paul mentions yeah thank you Nancy I hope that helps Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Selena uh, and uh, Narendra Kumar. I hope that has addressed your question uh, and please let us know. All right. Uh, so we move on now to Charles's question here, Charles Akili. Um, he says, are there scriptures that confirm that Paul's message to women was from a cultural context and not from the Holy Spirit? Uh, if culture had an impact on how the Bible was written, why then should we take it literally today when cultural has culture has greatly changed? So, um, um, Thanks, uh, Charles, for that question. 
Yeah. So uh, we we said that call, uh, certain scriptures that you know we difficult passages that we explained this morning. Um, we said that we must understand the context in which it was written. Uh, but understanding the culture and the context does not change the truth. You know, the truth remains the same, same uh, for all generations. And you know, so what we are seeking is the right interpretation of uh, God's word, uh, the truth. Uh, from what is being spoken so that it can be applied uh, you know across uh, generations so um culture your your the last part of what you said if culture had an impact on how the bible was written why then should we so we're not saying that uh, for every given culture the you know that culture is influencing scripture that's that's not uh, how paul wrote it uh, and uh, I, I think I'll let Pastor share. Yeah. And that's good. Okay, Charles. So let's answer the second part of your question first. If culture had an impact on the Bible, how the Bible was written? The answer is yes. The Bible, the Bible was written with culture in mind. And you can't take that away, right? From Genesis to Revelation. So when we study about interpreting scripture, which is a course that you will do, uh, I think in a second year. Uh, you will we will understand that the Bible has, like any book, uh, it was written in the language of the people, it was written in the context of the time, and it was written in the context of the culture. So the answer to the second part of the question is yes. Everywhere culture is involved, right? For example, uh, you know, in, in the New Testament, the Bible, you know, what Romans Paul says, you know, greet one another with a holy kiss. Now, is that cultural or is it? Biblical. I mean, is it something everybody has to do? No, that's cultural. That's part of how they greeted people. Today, we don't go around kissing everybody. Don't greet that. Different cultures, the way we express greeting is different. You know, I like that you can look at numerous examples. Genesis, Revelation, where culture plays in roles. For example, in the Old Testament, when somebody bought a piece of land, they would take off the shoe and give it to the other person. So that's a very cultural thing. Do we do that today? No, nobody will buy land by giving a piece of shoe. Right? You have to sign a paper, you have to sign a contract. So that's in the Bible, but it was, if you can't say it's in the Bible, you have to practice it today. No, nobody practices that today. right? So like that, throughout the Bible, there are lots of things which are very cultural. So answers to the second part of the question is yes. Everything was written in cultural context. Literary, literary style. So throughout the Bible, you have poetry, you have history, uh, you've got principles stated right so the, uh, like Nancy was saying we look at scripture we recognize the cultural context and we look for the principle there and the question we ask is is the principle transferable or not if it's transferable then we practice the principle not repeating the practice itself right so um, I may not give a shoe to somebody else but the principle is it's a covenant I sign Paper. So that principle applies. So uh, like this, there are many examples. So we look for the principle. The question we ask is, is the principle transferable? It's, is it permanent or is it temporary? Right? If it's temporary, it's meant for the people there at that time. Example, God told Abraham, take your son Isaac and offer him as a sacrifice. Today, if anybody takes their son to offer as a sacrifice, they'll be put in jail. So we can't read that and say, God told Abraham, offer your son as a sacrifice and go and do it. No, it was for a person in a context. There was a meaning to it. The principle is, you know, offer to God whatever is close to you as a sacrifice. That's the principle. So we practice the principle, which is obedience to God, offering to, uh, you know, the best we have as a sacrifice. But we don't repeat what Abraham did. Uh, so just giving some examples. So... So with that in mind, we can look at these passages, try to understand the culture, but more importantly, look at the principle. And actually, uh, when you go back to this whole issue of women ministering, uh, even if we exclude culture, even if you want to do that, we can exclude culture. But just looking at the text itself, we can prove that uh, Paul never intended for women not to preach and teach. Example, 1 Corinthians 14. Just look at the actual text. There he's talking to women. He says, women, if you have, if you want to ask anything, keep silent. Go ask your husband at home. 
So even if you just look at the text, obviously he's not talking to all women, he's talking only to wives, because he's saying, go ask your husband. And the matter is, if you have a question. So it's not a matter of teaching and ministering the word, First Corinthians 14. The issue is, he's speaking to married women, and he's telling them, if you have questions, go ask it at home. So even if you exclude culture, just by the text, you can prove that he's not talking. Uh, he's not preventing women from ministering. Well. Same thing with that First Timothy 2. Even if you exclude culture, don't bring culture in at all. You just look at the text. He's again talking to married women. Because in, uh, in, in, uh, you know, right uh, uh, from verse 8 onwards to verse 12, he's saying, First Timothy 2, he's talking about Adam and Eve. He's talking about childbearing. So the context immediately says, oh, he's talking to married women. He's not talking to all women. And he's talking about conduct. He's not talking about preaching and teaching the word. Because the preceding verses, he tells how men have to behave, how women have to behave. So we can go back to these same passages, exclude culture, just look at the text. And just by looking at the text, you can say that he's not preventing women from ministering the word. Yeah, hope that helps, Charles. Thank you, Pastor. Um, we'll move ahead. We, we have a lot of questions. We'll just see how many we can fit in the next two to three minutes. Um, Narendra Kumar, can women do ministry alone? Um, answer would be yes. If it comes to, you know, they're the only one and they have to do ministry, uh, answer is yes. We've already discussed the reasons how um, God calls women to minister. Would Jackin, um, as well as uh, Lucy, uh, have have talked about oh, jack and mentioned you know when um, men are overprotective of uh, their women and they don't let them step out and uh, serve under god's call how can we how how can we um, you know uh, see this mindset change that's jackin's question and lucy is saying um, that uh, women when they're considered only as a housewife and they're not allowed to speak or s sing or do god's work again you know uh, how to deal with this um, so pastor already talked about um, you know respect and freedom um, that that aspect is addressed uh, what we would say is that yeah there, there is a struggle uh, there is a cultural mindset out there uh, but uh, hopefully with um, better sensitization more information uh, when people are presenting scriptural perspective once you know people are aware of these things uh, this mindset is likely to change but uh, yeah it, it's it's a, a tough thing uh, it may take a while so whoever the women are in these situations just be strong believe god trust god uh, certainly the lord will open doors he will make a way for you to step out in your call um we'll just go ahead with um, daniel oliver uh, He's asking about Narendra Kumar's question. I, I think Pastor Selina already addressed it uh, in its context. Uh, so that would help uh, in understanding the, the scripture from 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Uh, and alias Daima, uh, we have addressed this matter about head covering, that it is not prescribed to the churches. So it's left to the churches if they want to uh, practice it. Uh, we'll probably take up Anusha's question, and uh, we will need to wrap this morning. She says, how do we recognize if a woman is anointed by God to minister? Uh, Pastor Selina, I'll give that last question to you, if you could please uh, answer Anusha's question, and then we'll pray and close. You're on mute, Pastor Selina. Sorry, Pastor Nancy. I was just looking uh, at uh, Jackin's question. She was asking for mm. uh, some uh, scripture passages that she can hold on and pray about. So just kind of uh, getting that for her. So I didn't uh, look at uh, which question would you like me to yeah. address? I'll, I'll quickly share that with you. Okay. So Anusha, she said, how do we recognize if a woman is anointed by God to minister. We have only one minute left. Okay, so anointing is basically the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit. And uh, so when we are born again, you know, the Holy Spirit comes and dwells in us. And when we are baptized in the Holy Spirit, uh, He fills us with His uh, power. And how do we recognize uh, we're anointed by God to minister? It's just basically the calling, I think, that we receive and we know and we 
uh, move in that calling and God opens doors for us to minister and we see people uh, lives being transformed minister to healed uh, I think that's how we know I hope sure. it helped. That was so quick and fast. Sorry. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Selina. And hope Anusha has addressed your question. Uh, let's pray and we close this morning. Abba Father, we thank you, Lord, for this time in your presence. Thank you for your precious word and uh, the instruction for life, O oh God. And uh, Father God, we just pray that you will help us to stay delighted in your word and, um, uh, Lord, to understand it and live by it, Father. We ask for blessings, Lord, upon all our faculty, all our students, their families. And we come at the rest of the day into your hands, O oh God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, thank you all faculty. Thank you students uh, for joining today's mentoring hour. God bless you. Have a wonderful day ahead. Praise the Lord. Uh,